Welcome to episode 101 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm going to share some strategies that you can use to stop comparing your classroom to other teachers' classrooms and to let go of that pressure to make your room look Pinterest-worthy. Visit truthforteachers.com to get the transcript, links to recommended resources, and to share your thoughts on the show. So I want to start off by making a confession. This is the time of year when classroom setup photos are everywhere. And each photo we see has more clever ideas and adorable decorations than the last. I find these images inspiring and creative and so much fun to look through. But they can also be incredibly anxiety producing for me. I don't even have a classroom and looking at room arrangements on Pinterest and Instagram still makes me feel like I can't possibly measure up. There are three types of thoughts that tend to run through my mind when I see a really awesome idea online on social media. One thing that I think sometimes is, wow, I should have thought of that myself. It's such a simple idea. It's so obvious. How could I have missed that? Ah, I can't believe I spent all those years doing it a different way. Other photos inspire me to think, wow, I never would have thought of that myself. I'll look at something and think, man, I never would have thought to do that. That's so impressive. Must have taken them forever. But wait, is this what parents and kids expect nowadays? Are other teachers judging those who don't go all out like this? Does it make you look lazy or like you don't care when your classroom doesn't look this amazing? So sometimes I kind of feel that thought, like I never would have thought of it. I never could do it. And the third type of thought that sometimes pops into my head when I'm looking at these images on social media is, I did it already, but mine looks amateurish in comparison. So sometimes I'll think things like this. Oh, hey, I have a setup similar to that, but my handwriting is atrocious and it's not colorful. And basically my version looks like total crap in comparison to theirs. Do I need to completely redo mine? I'm sort of embarrassed about it now. And that's sort of the process that repeats on and on and on the more that I'm scrolling through all of these different awesome ideas that are on places like Instagram and Pinterest. Now, ironically, I'm sure that some of the ideas that I have shared online have created those same feelings in other people. So this isn't about teachers intentionally creating a competition or trying to put themselves on a pedestal. It's just human nature to look at what others are doing or to see what other people have accomplished and compare yourself. So I think these kinds of self-defeating and critical thoughts say more about the person thinking them than the person who's just doing their thing and sharing about it online. I do not make the assumption that just because something looks good, it's not also helping kids learn. I know that many teachers are capable of focusing on both, of having a classroom that deserves to be featured in a magazine spread and a classroom that is also rigorous. If you can do both, that is fantastic. But this episode is for the tens of thousands of us that feel like we can't. We have a limited amount of time and money and energy, and we just can't afford to dedicate that much effort to creating an elaborate theme in our classroom or making sure that everything matches or sewing curtains for our classroom windows. We either don't enjoy it or aren't good at it or just can't afford the time and money that it takes to make something like that happen. So the question that I want to answer today is not, how can we stop other teachers from creating beautiful learning spaces and sharing them on social media? That's not my goal at all. I don't want to take anything away from those teachers. And we can't reverse this train that's already in motion anyway, where people are making and sharing more options than ever before to make your classroom look amazing. That's just what it is. So I don't want to undermine that. The question that I want to answer is, How do we each stay reflective on our own vision for our own classroom and not get sucked into comparing ourselves to others? And I want to start answering that question by addressing why I feel like this has become harder and harder to overcome every year. I started teaching in 1999, and for many years, the only classrooms that I saw were those in my own school building. 
even as late as 2003, there were only a handful of teachers who had access to digital cameras and the understanding of HTML coding to be able to upload those pictures and share them on their own websites. Ironically, that's how my website, The Cornerstone for Teachers, started that very year in 2003. I wanted to show other teachers how I organized my papers and set up my centers and so on, because those kinds of tutorials were not only not widely available, um, they just, most teachers just didn't know what was happening outside of their school building. So I did things like store my classroom materials in the cast off candy boxes from Walmart. You know how at Halloween time they have those big cardboard cases that they display candy in in the stores? Well, they recycle those when the season is up. So I would go around to the local Walmart and Walgreens and those kinds of places and ask, can I take them? And then I borrowed the school's digital camera. I didn't have one myself, that was new technology. And I took pictures of scissors and glue sticks in an old cardboard M&M box. And teachers really thought it was the best thing ever. It was one of their few opportunities to see how other educators were doing things. We did not have fonts and graphics and beautiful digital products that we could buy for a few dollars and just print them out and be good to go. We weren't even really buying a lot of stuff online at that point. A trip to the local teacher supply store was the foundation of what we believed to be on trend. That was pretty much the extent of our decorating options. And it was expensive. So we hand wrote and handmade just about everything. And it all looked pretty awful in comparison to today's standards. Over the years, and particularly I would say in the last four to five years, every teacher has had increased access to beautiful, inexpensive decorating resources. We have the target dollar spot. We have teachers pay teachers. We have fonts and clip art galore that allow us to make and decorate our own materials pretty easily now. Even if you're not super creative, just a few minutes on Pinterest or Instagram will give you hundreds of ideas that you can try. And many of them are just amazing looking. The bar for design, the bar for photography, the bar for everything really, it's all been raised because the tools for making things look attractive are now cheaper and easier to make. And here's the most critical part. No one ever saw what we used to be doing in our classrooms except for our students and our colleagues. My kids didn't care that I was using an old M&M box to hold their scissors. And I don't recall any other teacher in my school who had a super impressive way of storing supplies. So I never felt pressure to cover the boxes with colored contact paper or spray paint them or buy any legitimate containers. I was able to do what worked for me without comparing myself much to others or inadvertently making others compare themselves to me. But now the number of people who see what we're doing is much bigger. Students, parents, colleagues, administrators are all taking photos and videos of what's happening in school and they're broadcasting them to the world. We're no longer creating for the 30 kids in our classroom, but for the thousands of people online who might see it. We are now acutely aware of what thousands of other teachers in schools are doing too, not only in decorating their classrooms, but in the amazing school culture that they've created. Their fantastic immersive lessons, the adorable outfits they're wearing, the amazing looking food that they're eating, and the perfect looking home that they live in with an adorable looking family. We see it all. And in short, we compare their highlight reel to our real life. We see their best projects, the most attractive areas of their classrooms, their most engaging lessons, and we unintentionally compare that to our full reality. We think about our own worst stuff, the ugliest part of our classroom where there's just this gigantic mess of stuff piled on a table and we think, my room is awful. But we're not seeing other people's mess. And there's always mess. I mean, if you've seen any of my videos, for example, the background behind me usually looks really nice. I assure you, the rest of my home does not look like that. That's why I tend to do my videos in the same place. There's one spot in my house that looks really nice visually, and the rest is just pretty normal looking. I don't do Facebook Lives in a place where you can see the gigantic pile of clothes on the chair in my bedroom, or the dirty dishes in the sink. And because you don't see them, you might assume they're not there, but they are. 
I also have special lighting that I use when I'm making a video because if I just use the regular lighting, everything's all shadowy and weird looking and accentuates every wrinkle on my face. I'm not gonna intentionally show you the worst side of me and neither will most people. Other than the occasional, you know, ha ha, massive fail, look how bad this turned out type of image, most of us are posting only our best, most flattering photos and videos. We are carefully curating the parts of our lives and our work that we want to share with others. And that's not a bad thing. I don't think the whole world wants to see my husband's socks on the floor. Most of us are just sharing the ideas and the work and the accomplishment and the moments that we are proud of. And that's okay. We just need to keep that in mind when we start feeling that pressure to compare. So let's return to that question that I asked in the beginning. How do we each stay focused and reflective on our own vision for our own classroom and not get sucked into comparing ourselves to others? Well, first off, know that the pressure you are feeling is growing every year for many teachers. It is not just you who looks at the magnitude of options and ideas out there and gets immediately overwhelmed and starts feeling inferior. Second, realize that most of this pressure is something that we are placing on ourselves. Sometimes it might be coming from parents or administrators or someone else who's urging you to do more, but the majority of our stress in this area is self-imposed. We are the ones looking at all the different ideas and allowing ourselves to fall into the comparison trap. So third, actively push against that internal voice that says, you are not enough. You need to do more. Set your classroom up in a way that works for you and your students. Every school, every teacher, every group of kids is unique. There is no one right way to set up a classroom. Remind yourself, I am enough. My efforts are enough. I have a limited amount of time and energy at the beginning of the school year, and I choose to channel my resources into creating a room that helps me teach more effectively and efficiently throughout the school year, regardless of what everyone else is doing. The purpose of my classroom space is to help kids learn and to help me teach. I choose to stay focused on this purpose. I can be okay with having a classroom that doesn't look like a magazine spread. My room does not have to be perfect on day one. It's going to evolve throughout the year according to what my students need and according to what they want in their learning environment. I am going to stay focused on the kids and streamlining the learning process for them. Because if I do that, I can't go wrong. I hope that message is one that you will think about in the coming weeks as back to school mania sets in online. Remember what really matters. Don't bow to any kind of self-imposed Pinterest pressure. Do what makes sense for you and your students. What really makes your classroom an amazing place to learn is you, not your stuff. The final way that you can stay focused on your own vision for your own classroom and not get sucked into comparing yourself to others is to be reflective on your why. I want to invite you and everyone listening to do some self-reflection here. We need to have hard conversations about some topics without thinking that just bringing this whole subject up is dividing us or teacher shaming people who do things differently. We need to each know what we're doing in our classrooms and why. Because once you know the why, you no longer feel that pressure to be like everyone else. It doesn't matter as much what anyone else is doing or what they think about what you're doing if you know your purpose. Think about why you want your classroom to look the way that it does and what the purpose of decorating it is. I know that you might feel like decorating your classroom is your only creative outlet, the only place where you really have some autonomy as a teacher now. It represents you, and you want to represent yourself well, and you want it to be a comfortable place for you to spend time all day. But the thing is, the classroom doesn't just represent you. It represents all the kids in your classroom, too. So you can think of decorating as a journey that you will take with them over time. You can express yourself and your creativity through your interactions with kids, through your relationship with them. That's where the real you and your talent shine through, not what's hanging on your walls. Remember your takeaway truth for the week ahead. 
What really makes your classroom an amazing place to learn is you, not your stuff. Making that shift won't be easy, but it will be worth it. Have a great week. Truth For Teachers is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. For more great podcast recommendations, go to edupodcastnetwork.com. That's E-D-U podcastnetwork.com.